Before I begin, I want to extend our gratitude and thanks to all of you in Christ Jesus for your gracious hospitality Amen. and congenial spirits and the various discussions that we've had. Mm -hmm. It's been very, uh, very enjoyable to us and I pray our paths will cross again sometime this side of uh, eternity. This morning I'd like to minister on the benefits of having spiritual peace. First let me take a few minutes and define what I mean by benefits. Benefits are not options or alternatives. In the kingdom of God, they're not supplementals or additions that you can take or leave. In Christ, benefits are mandatory. Jesus didn't die so you'd have a chance to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. Now let me explain why it's this way. I'll depict the uh, life of faith in a linear manner. Let's say this right here. This, like, this is your life in Christ. This is this beginning. When you're born again. Or when you're baptized into Christ. Now what happens when you're baptized into Christ or you're born again is God himself puts you into Christ. Now this is stated in 1 Corinthians 1.30, so it's not like an interpretation. God puts you in Christ. Colossians refers to it as the operation of God. We were baptized, we had faith, he said, in the operation of God. It happened when you were baptized, but it's what happened behind the scenes that puts you into Christ. Now the question is, remember this is your entire life in Christ. The question is, where did, he put, where did he put you? Did he put you here in the middle of Christ? If I were, and I hope you don't object to the phrase, but if you do, I don't care. Or if you were of a Baptistic theology, is it that he puts you here? In a state of perfection and can't be reversed. Where did God put you? He puts you here. Just like Israel, when they got to the promised land, they were right, they got in the promised land, right at the border. Jericho. That's where you were put in Christ, right up here at the beginning. Now the objective is to get from here to here before you leave the world. Benefits are what enable you to get from here to here. A valid, I'll condescend and call it church service, I don't particularly like it, but I'll just, a valid church service is helping you get from here to here. Because if you don't get from here to here, it doesn't make any difference whether or not you got in here. You must go on to perfection, that's Hebrews 6. Perfection means maturity. You've got to grow up into Christ in all things. That's Ephesians 4.15. Now when I'm talking about benefits, I'm talking about things that come from God that enable you to make this pilgrimage successfully. And blessed is he that arrives safely 
at the grave. Now spiritual peace has a great deal to do with this progress because you've got to have benefits or advantages that are not inherent in your nature. Mm -hmm. You've got to have something from God that's, that originates outside of yourself, but at some point is deposited in yourself. You've got to have that to make it from, this is why I deplore shallow preaching. Mm -hmm. I refuse to listen to it. This is why I refuse to preach to dead churches. Someone says, well, you ought to have mercy on them. They don't have too many people have mercy on them. Yeah. Yeah. Dead churches went from living to dying. Yeah. Nobody's born dead. There are no stillbirths in Christ. Mm -hmm. There aren't. Somebody dropped the ball getting from here. Yeah, that's true. To here. Now I say I won't preach for a dead church, but church <laughs> asked me to preach for them. I can assume there's a little life left in them yet. <laughs> I mean, don't take too far what I said here. <laughs> All right, now the benefits of spiritual peace. What a, uh, how does it help us? Paul said, Philippians 4, 6, Be careful. Don't fret. Don't be filled with care. Or the modern psychological word is anxiety. That's not in the Bible. Cast down. That's the Bible word. Something external to the person threw them down to the ground. Be careful for how much? Nothing. He doesn't say, now be careful except if it's your family. Then really have a lot of care. Really stay awake at night thinking about that. Be careful for nothing. No, I mean you're going to lose your job. You're, you're not going to be able to make a living. And I'm going to, I've got to worry about it. See here, I'll worry if I want to worry. Be careful for nothing. But in, not because of, but in everything, make your request known unto God with, 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 Thanksgiving. Amen. Right, that's the prelude to the verse that we're going to say. Mm -hmm. Be careful for nothing, but in, in, in the middle of the cauldron, in the middle of the whirlpool, in the middle of the vortex, it's sucking you down to the bottom. In the middle of it, tell God what you want and thank Him. You know, Jonah the fish come up when he said, Salvation's of the Lord. <laughs> Yeah. Fish head to the top and spit him out. It was Thanksgiving. And the peace of God, that's presu presuming you did this. If you didn't did that, if you didn't do that, then I can't give you this other verse. You gotta do that first. If you've done that, then the peace of God, which passes all understanding. You cannot give a rational explanation for peace. It'll fall short. You can't do it. You can't find an explanation in a dictionary or a lexicon. It, not, it surpasses understanding. See, humanity, you take God out of the picture now, and humanity cannot have an idea or an imagination beyond the circumference of human experience. It's impossible. They can't think outside. In any way, not a dream, not an imagination, it's always a corruption of something that's in the circumference. The peace of God cannot be understood within the framework of human experience. You've got to at some point get outside of that into God's domain where God's the primary worker and where Jesus is reigning, where the Holy Spirit is functioning. Get, get outside that, then you'll, you'll be able to have 
some kind of realization of peace. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep, will keep stable, will keep in a state of solidity, will keep sane, if you want to use that word, will keep hopeful, will keep you from despair. It'll keep your heart, wherever heart and mind are mentioned in Scripture, heart's always first. It's never, never, never mind, then heart. It's heart, then mind. And the mind functions according to what's in the heart. Mm -hmm. You got a new heart, your mind just clicking away. Thinking right. You got a bad heart, you got garbage coming out of your mind. That's just the way it is. Amen. It'll keep your heart, that's your real fundamental person. <coughs> Psychology talks about psyche. There's no such thing. That's cooked up. That's a human explanation that views man basically as a physiological character. The heart. The heart is a scriptural word that they try and understand with the word psyche. It's the real you, it's what makes you click, it's what makes you, it's what feeds the rest of your person. It's where your preferences, your loves, your hates, that's where it is. But your heart's got to be stable. You can't have a heart that flip-flops or goes up and down. Or you change your mind a lot. You can't have a heart like that. You'll keep your heart Keeping your heart means you can hear when God talks, because when God talks to you personally, he whispers. When God talks to the multitudes, he shouts like from heaven, but they thought it thunder. <laughs> they didn't know it was God. And when your heart's stable, you can pick up on how God's directing you. You may not be able to explain that to someone else unless they've had the experience too. Then they'll know what you're, what you're talking about. But it's the peace of God that stabilizes your hearts. You become dependable from God's viewpoint. You become mature from God's point. You're, you're not easily confused out of your heart's stable. It'll keep your heart and your mind. The same people's minds like a young girl. You don't know from day to day how these people are going to think. By the time you think they're thinking good, they talk like an idiot. You've seen it, haven't you? I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Their mind is unstable. That doesn't mean that they, been, they don't have rationality, like some people don't have a full rationality, but it's not their, not their fault. It's not a willing condition. But some people are just tossed around like a ball. Scriptures say tossed to and fro by everyone to doctrine. They turn on the TV and say, oh, well, that was really good, wasn't it? When it might have been terrible. But it sounded good because the guy said, you, you can be rich. <clears throat> but like the man said, I tell you what I do, I love God so much, I'm going to give him a tithe of the lottery that I won. <laughs> do they really think God wants that? Their mind is not stable from a from a spiritual point of view. Again, I'm very careful to say I'm not talking about people that are a little slow. Not, I'm not talking about that. Your mind's gotta be in good shape. If you if you have a continual intersection with the world, like on your job or maybe your neighbor or whatever, your mind's gotta be stable. Because Satan's working out there trying to get a false idea in your mind. It's like a flaming arrow. Now you know what a flaming arrow is. It just says that shield of faith wherewith you're able to quench all the fiery darts so the wicked one. Fiery darts are thoughts. That's what they are. You'll throw them in. You've got to have a sound mind to be able to take is this really my thought? It's in my mind. Is it really my thought? Or did Satan throw that in there? Or is it a temptation? And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people 
They don't know the difference between temptation and fiery dirt. They can't tell the difference. So if a thought pops in their minds, a terrible thought, and well, we, we people, we can have some really, we never tell you what thoughts we've had. But some of them weren't ours. They were thrown at us. That's what a fiery dart is, is a temptation. The grace of God will teach you to say, I reject. That, or if you're on the ball, you'll have your shield of faith and it'll stop it from coming in. <laughs> If you're strong in faith, you have less of these thoughts, yeah. temptations. If you're weak in the faith, you have, you'll have like you see the old movies with the warriors that shoot arrows and a, a whole battery of arrows fly through the air. That's if you have a weak faith, you've got a battery of arrows, contempt, contemptible thoughts being hurled at you by Satan. You say, how can I, whoo, how can I avoid that? Because man to man or person to person, Satan frankly is stronger than me. You don't want to try and fight the devil. Mm -hmm. Who do you think is going to win? You think you're going to win? You resist the devil, mm -hmm. not fight him. You resist the devil, not rebuke him. How do you resist him? You just say, no. Another thing, Satan has no response for no. <coughs> Why you say no? That's how Jesus resisted him. He said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus, he, talked, he, he gave him some words, but at essential, he said, no. I'm not going to do that. The peace of God will enable you to do this. When you have the peace of God, you will be able to resist these fiery darts or flaming arrows that are thrown at you by Satan. You'll keep your mind, so you can use your mind for productive things. And your mind, uh, it's like the kitchen, like the kitchen of your person. It's where everything's put together. Now you are expert cooks. You look in the cupboard, you've got all the essential things to make what you're going to make. But now, if you're not a good cook, you don't know how to combine those things, you know. So you say, this time I think I'm going to use a cup of salt. <laughs> and I'm going to use an eighth a teaspoon of sugar. Okay, you say, well, that kind of person doesn't know how to, how to cook. All right, there's people that don't know how to think. They go to the same cupboards you do. They go to the same cupboards you do. And they pick out some ingredients and they try and bake a cake called Once Saved, Always Saved. You go to the same cupboard, take some ingredients out of the cupboard, and they cook a cake that says, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. What's wrong with it? Their mind is deficient. Their mind hasn't been kept. They don't know how to process truth. Mm. Now you'll learn about, about people that are in Christ. The distinction of people that are growing in Christ is they can draw a proper conclusion. <coughs> That's when you're mature in Christ. People that aren't mature in Christ, they can't draw a proper conclusion. They can't, they can't add up the things of God and come up to a right answer. But if the peace of God keeps your heart and mind, you will be able to assemble truth in the right way and come up with the right conclusion. You'll be able to take the promises of God and put them together and get a joyous benefit out of it. Peace of God does it keep your heart and your mind. Now, of course, this kind of praying for this, praying and receiving this assumes your unquestionable dependence upon God. Now that that has that's a foregone assumption. And if you're not totally dependent on God, then these verses are out. You've got to work on being dependable on God or believing God or believing that He is now He is and that He is now He is. 
a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Until you are so persuaded of that, you will not contradict it. You will not live contrary to that. When you are tempted to act as though God wasn't, you just won't do it. And when you're tempted to act as though God is not a rewarder, that your faithfulness to God will not be forgotten. God is not unrighteous to forget your work of faith and labor of love. But until you're convinced of that, so convinced means you will not live contrary to it, well, you're, uh, you're unstable. Job Paul posed a question that, remember there was no Bible in Job's day. <laughs> 60 chapters about a man that didn't have a Bible. Whew. And some of this stuff is very good. That was what we might call intuitive knowledge. God made it intuitive. I understand that. But it's, in it he said, uh, when God gives quietness, who can make trouble? Well, what is your answer to that question? When God gives quietness, that's, that's another word for peace. So, when God gives quietness, who can make trouble? Well, so, how easily are you just agitated? You want peace, that's a benefit. And that's one benefit. It will keep your heart, keep it solid, keep it so God can... So Jesus can dwell in your heart by faith. You probably heard people say you've asked Jesus into your heart. That's nowhere in Scripture. No one ever said that in Scripture. Jesus comes into your heart. You don't, you don't ask him into your heart. In fact, Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians 3.17 that God through the Holy Spirit would enable Christ to dwell in your heart by faith. What's that? So the question isn't, is Christ in your heart? The question is, is he living there? Is that his abode? You might picture Jesus dwelling in a person. Like a man, a mature man. And a man comes in his house and there's, there's a stranger sitting in a rocking chair in his living room. He says, like, who are you? <laughs> well, he says, I'm, I'm Jesus Christ. What are you doing here? Well, he says, you've been so busy. I've been in the back room back here in a closet. I couldn't really do anything here, and I'm, I'm about ready to move out of here unless you really want me to do something. Don't you know there's people like this? They think they can get Jesus out of the closet, you know for an emergency. This isn't the way it works, brethren. Jesus got to live in your heart. And picture your heart as a house that has a lot of rooms. Our house has 24 rooms. And we don't have a maid either. 24 rooms. All right, now picture your heart as having 24 rooms. Jesus has got to have unhindered and unlimited access to all those rooms. To dwell in your heart. He's got to dwell in the TV room. Yeah. Game room. He's got to dwell. All right, now the heart, the peace of God, when he dwells in your heart, will rule your heart. This is uh, Colossians 3.15. Now there's a prelude to that to that verse. I want to actually read read this Colossians uh, three twelve. Colossians three fifteen. What I've just referred to says, "Let let let the peace of God dwell in your heart, to the which also ye are called, and be ye thankful." Let, in other words, the, the peace wants to live there, but it has to have your consent, so to speak. 
to live there. Now, the preceding verses to that that lead up to this says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. See, what does that mean? Your spiritual makeup has bowels like your body does. They're spiritual bowels. They're where the stuff you know is processed, where the nourishment is administered out of it. It's about bowels are missing quite often. The bowels of Christ, bowels of mercy. Mm -hmm. It makes it's a spiritual, it's a critical part of your spiritual makeup. As the elect of God put on bowels of mercies, humble kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And if any man has a quarrel against any, anyone ever quarrel against somebody? Even as Christ forgave you, ye also do ye. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let the peace of God dwell in your heart. Now that's a benefit. If you want to get from here to there, you've got to let the peace of God take up residence in your heart, just like you do with Christ. You've got, it's got to take up, take up residence, and you've got to allow it. The peace of God will rule your heart. You've got to administrate your heart. Your heart has like a throne. Who's on the throne? For some people, it's them. They're on the throne. Their self-will is on the throne. For some other people, it's some other individual that is dictating how they live. But if you let it, the peace of God will rule your heart. And he'll administer things you can't administer. He will correct things you can't correct. You've got to have that benefit to get from here to here. You've got to have it. You've got to have outside intervention. And the peace of God is part of it. Now here's another, the peace of God. We're talking about benefits of the peace of God. This is from Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou, God, will keep him in perfect peace. Oh, perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, fixed, focused, set. Yeah, these big telescopes, you know, you, we used to have them for, for some of the children. You put them up in the head. Well, you want to examine a certain part of the sky, you had to tighten everything down and fix that, fix that telescope so it was settled on that area. Perfect peace is like that. It tweaks everything in your soul, tweaks it so you're focused right on. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, fixed, focused. Storms going on over here, I'm fixed. Trouble over here, I'm fixed. Huh? God says, I'll keep him in perfect. I'll do it. Not you. I'll. You've got to believe this. Now you've got to believe God will do this. Mm -hmm. Fixed. That's the same thing as saying set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Seek the things that are above for Christ dwells at the right hand of God. Not the things on earth. That's Colossians 1 and 3, 1 and 2. That's saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. You've got to live and run the race with your eye fixed on Jesus. You say, well, what about the stuff going on over here? You are given like miraculous peripheral vision. If your mind is down here, normal peripheral vision, you can kind of see something going on over, over here. But when you've got this perfect peace, you have perfect peripheral vision. You can be focused here and still know what's going on over here. It's like a fisheye camera lens. Fish eye came you lens, I could stand right here, capture everybody in the audience, and I'm walls over there in one one, but I'm I'm a looking at the clock back there. Yeah. Thou will keep me in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on me. 
These are all things out there doable. I'm not talking about hypothetical situations or something that could be or try your best to get to this place. This stuff really happens. But it all centers, see, in Christ and your access to Christ and that you're in the sort of person that you have a right to access Christ because you're in Him and you're listening to Him. Perfect peace. I will keep it in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on the. You're thinking on the right things. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are right, just, whatsoever things are lovely, and so forth, so forth. Think on these things. Philippians 4 8. That's a perfect peace. That's what it results in. You think about right things. You're not like a daydreamer. I know that people say these days, God wants you to fulfill your dreams. God wants your dreams to be dashed to the ground. He wants you to adopt his agenda. He wants you to adopt what he's doing. Forget what you want to do. And he, because he will seek your best interest. You, if you trust in God, you will get the very best. You can't, he'll do what you can't do. And he'll help you to see it. <coughs> Isaiah 30, 15 says, In quietness, that's his peace, mm -hmm. perfect peace. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. <laughs> I can remember uh, when I was younger in high school, there was a boy. I don't know if I heard his voice till you're about junior year. No one heard him say anything. He's kind of a pip squeak of a guy. Uh, no one ever heard him, but somebody agitated this boy one day. We all saw it. <clears throat> he was considered to be larger than this boy. Man, he was like a lion. He gobbled that guy up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? He uh, quietness and confidence. He didn't care how big the person was. Perfect peace will do that. Perfect peace. We'll take a man like Moses and you march right up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Just quietness and confidence, did that. Quietness and confidence. We'll take David and he'll march out to Goliath and say, this day I'm going to be the end of you and feed your flesh to the birds. Quietness and confidence. It'll take Daniel and put him in the lion's den and he'll just get a good nice rest. Quietness and confidence. It'll take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and they'll walk, they'll walk in the furnace. The fire. And the only thing that burned up was their bonds. Yes, that's right. Your trials will do that if you let it. Your trials will burn up your handicaps. I'm, I've got to move on here. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing... Let me check and make sure that it's right. Yeah. It's in the Hebrew too. Nothing shall offend them. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now in the scripture, offend doesn't mean like, you hurt my feelings. Well, boo-hoo. You can't come before God and say, they hurt my feelings. I suppose God is saying, you hurt mine, you know. Stumble in scripture me out. Uh, offend. Pardon? Offend. Nothing shall offend you, thank you. Nothing shall offend them. Offense in scripture means stumble. Stumble as there's a hole where I didn't see and I fell down. Nothing shall cause them to get tripped up. Nothing will cause them to make like a big blunder. Oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I mean, I know I'm probably the only person that's had situations like that where I thought, oh, on. I took the wrong detour there. 
see how what happened, what actually happens in situations like that, my own interests trumped the interests of God. That's actually what happened. Thank God for someone when I was younger that alerted me to that so I could diagnose it. Perfect peace have they that love thy law. And nothing you can be you can be walking through Philistia or where the Amalekites are. And they won't make you stumble at all. Nothing shall offend them. <clears throat> Let me take a moment and comment on nothing shall offend them. From Romans, the uh, eighth chapter, I believe it is. Romans 8, beginning at verse 35. This is right after, you know, all things work together for good and the love of God and so forth. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That is, it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are count. Oh, is that really in the Bible? Oh, shit, that, that's, a, that's a match up with the TV preachers. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is, that is what it says. For thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, that perfect peace, see, that, this is perfect peace. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able, shall be, they won't be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I know certain people will just get over that and say, there you are. You can't fall away. Well, I don't want to hammer on this because someone, I used to hear people say, what does your church believe? They say, we believe you can fall away. I said, well, is there anything else you got there? I mean, that doesn't sound like too appealing. <laughs> oh, yeah, church, I come from. That's what we did. We believe you can fall away. So I'd say, well, I believe that you can live close to God and not fall away. <laughs> what this means is no influence external to yourself can cause this situation. No person outside of you, counting the devil and principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness and high places and the rulers of the darkness of the world, none of them can drive a wedge between you and Christ. And if they seek to do it, you're in Jesus' hand. He said, nobody can pluck you out. And beside that, my Father's hand, which is my hands in my Father's hand, and no man can pluck them out of his. A perfect peace will tell you that. He'll take fear out of your heart. Perfect peace. Now the final. Benefit. Get, get from here to there. Peace with God is the foundational peace. Mm -hmm. That's what all this other stuff is built on. Peace with God. Being justified by faith. Being, being <coughs> justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1. So that kind of peace is like the root is to a tree. Where a foundation is to a house. In this, uh, this peace, this is peace that Jesus made. Colossians 1, 20, 21 says that through his death he made peace. This is a created peace. Mm -hmm. See, you didn't make it. Church didn't make it. Jesus made it. But he'll give it to you. Jesus isn't agitated in heaven, is he? You think he's wringing his hands because of the state of the USA? Say, well, things are really going out of whack down there, Father. What are we going to do? That's how men talk. That's not how Jesus talks. And the more you have the mind of Christ, that will not be the way you talk either. You'll say, this, this is a bad situation. 
and it looks like nothing good can come from this unless something radical happens. Let the will of the Lord be done. Yes. If it's your will, God, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, I consent, take it or take them out. If it's your desire, Father, not to do it, I consent to that too. Jesus made the peace. Now when you have this peace that Jesus made, upon which all this other peace is built, you have boldness. Boldness in Scripture doesn't mean brashness. Mm -hmm. It means confidence. You can come, this is Hebrews 4.16, you can come boldly to the throne of all grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the time of need. I say in the, in the time of need. Which might have take Jesus out of the scenario, the time of need would have beat you down. But in this case, here, now, this is the secret, brother, <laughs> to a not sinning. Of course, you're commanded that three times in the apostolic writing, sin not. Take it seriously. Here's the secret to overcoming sin. Catch it in the temptation level. You can because it's already, we've already been told. To begin with, no temptation is unique. All temptation is common. So if you're tempted somewhere, there's a, maybe a billion people have been tempted the same way. All temptation is common. With the temptation, God will not <coughs> allow you to be tempted above your ability. He knows your ability. It's important that you know it, too. It's important. He will not allow you to be tempted above your ability, but will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. Now, at the temptation level, which is the level Jesus defeated it on, right? It's at the temptation level. That's where you get it. You get it and nip it in the bud at the temptation level. And how you do it is by going, coming boldly or confidently to the throne of mercy to obtain grace to help in the time of need, which is a time of temptation as well as others. That's a secret. You let, you let uh, sin get out of control, and it's hard to recover from it. Recovery from sin is always hard. It's not impossible, but it is hard. Never in the butt of the temptation level. You can come boldly. In fact, Hebrews 10.22 says, come boldly. To the Lord, having your a true heart and the conscience purged, and your body's washed with pure water. Yeah. Come confidently. <clears throat> now, the longer you wait, the less confident you'll be. I'm telling you the truth, but I'm telling you the truth here. The longer you tarry, the harder it'll be to come. And the more you'll have to overcome, and the more apt you are to be overcome by sin. But if you have peace with God, it enables you to come at the proper time, early on. Before the thing, before the fire is burning. Before that fiery dart set anything on fire. It'll enable you to quench it with the seal of faith. Perfect peace does that. In other words... You should know you have eternal life. Did I ask you, do you know, not, not I think I do, do you know you have eternal life? John, uh, he wrote his first letter, chapter 5, verse 13, he says, These things I write unto you, that you might know you have eternal life. So I'm asking you, do you know? You have eternal life. If you do, you got the peace we're talking about. And normally when we have uh, invitations, people think, uh, limit their thinking, the people that need to be come to Christ and we, that should be done. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not in any way suggesting you don't do that. 
And I think this is an invitation that should be offered. In the older days, they used to do this. They don't do much anymore. So I'm going to ask you a question. If you got the wrong answer, I'm going to ask you to respond to this invitation. Was there ever a time in your life, ever, ever, when you were stronger than you are now, closer to God than you are now, believed in the Lord more than you do now? Was there ever such a time as that? If there was, you have backslid. But I got some good news for you. You can come back. You can get up and come back. And he'll anoint you with the oil of joy. So that's what I'm asking. If you're out of Christ, you don't dare walk out that back door in the same condition. Settle it right here, right now. If you've declined in your spiritual life, you don't have to. You don't have to stay there. You don't. Doesn't make any difference how bad it is. You don't have to stay there. You can get up. There's people here that'll help you. Get your feet on the ground again. Have the peace of God again, and you'll know it was worth it. It was worth it, humiliating or not. Mm -hmm. I pray every person will examine their heart, do what's appropriate. All right, brother, we're ready to for you. 327. We use as that song. If you need to make.